In the 1930s, hundreds of Canadians decided the Spanish Civil War was their cause too. Edward Cecil Smith was one of them. He became the only Canadian to command an entire battalion in Spain. Author Tyler Wenzel tells the story of this violent pacifist in his new book, Not for King or Country, Edward Cecil Smith, the Communist Party of Canada, and the Spanish Civil War. Tyler Wenzel is a historian, legal scholar, and soldier in the Canadian Armed Forces. He joins us now. It's really nice to meet you in person. Thank you for having me. Terrific book, so much research. <laughs> you, you know, at the beginning of the book, you made a little joke that you're, uh, you probably bored your wife with all the tidbits of information that you had. Yeah, as I found piece by piece, every little story, unfortunately, my wife had to bear with my <laughs> excitement and uh, she, was, she was a very good sport about it. Well, congratulations, it's a, a terrific read. Um, how did the effects of the Great Depression in the 1930s have many Canadians leaning towards communism and the Soviet Union? Well, the, the trauma of the First World War and then the Depression left many people confronted with the question of, do we stick with the system that we have? Do we make incremental changes or do we make drastic, significant changes? So for some people, that meant fascism, as they saw rising in Germany, Spain, Italy, and elsewhere. And for others, that meant communism, which had been made, had been manifested in the Soviet Union through the revolution. And the Soviet Union manipulated the media such that there was the culture war between the different groups was able to play out. You could read one set of facts and believe they've truly built a utopia. So some people looked at that, believed it, as Edward Cecil Smith did, and wanted to see that kind of revolution play out in Canada. So let's get to know this person. Uh, so Edward Cecil Smith, he was raised to admire British institutions. He became a banker. He's a, he was a devout Christian. Uh, not your average characteristics uh, for a socialist. So how does this guy then become attracted to communism and ultimately become a significant organizer for the Communist Party of Canada? Right up until 1929 or so, you really couldn't look at a person and see more of a quintessential middle-class white Anglo-Saxon Protestant that was pretty typical of the time. Like you said, banker, children of missionaries, he served in the militia, very much integrated with those mainstream sort of institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some ways that almost made him hypersensitive to the problems of the depression because he held British, what he perceived to be British values in such high esteem that as the depression went on, he saw travesties of justice being such a perversion of what he held dear. Mm -hmm. And he saw those values for him more clearly manifested in the Communist Party of Canada, which was paying for workers' legal defense, for instance, mm -hmm. at a time when people were being charged for committing the crime, for instance, of speaking Yiddish in a public hall. Mm. So how there was a lot of hatred uh, for communists in Canada at the time. How much? significant to the point of violence. In, here in Toronto, for instance, in 1929, there was a rally uh, at which point um, the police cleared Queen's Park using motorcycle and horse charges. And this happened elsewhere. And again, these were entirely peaceful rallies. The first use of tear gas in Canada was done at the Standard Theatre. It was a celebration of the, one of the anniversaries of Lenin's death. They used tear gas to clear the hall, also a peaceful assembly. So there was significant violence. There was a, a very deeply rooted concern that the people who were advocating for revolution would indeed turn to violence to pursue that revolution. So that led to the Canadian government having to figure out what to do with this problem. So how, what did Canada do to the Communist Party of Canada from 1931 to 1936? We were the only country in the English-speaking world that actually made the Communist Party membership in it, possession of its materials, etc., a criminal act. So in the summer of 1931, there was uh, actually nine major arrests that were committed in a cross-country task force. Uh, there was a trial and under section 98 of the criminal code, the leadership of the Communist Party was put in jail and the party was outlawed. And that law wasn't repealed until 1936. This forced the party underground, but certainly did not kill it and actually made it more popular than it had been before. Um, you know, Great Britain and the United States persecuted members of the Communist Party, but they didn't ban the, uh, the Communist Party. Why did Canada respond in such a way? Well, Prime Minister R.B. Bennett was a, a devout anti-communist. Um, his Minister of Justice was as well. Um, 
there were some rumblings that there was armed drilling of Communist Party members in the Don River Valley. So there was those kinds of concerns that something like that was happening. No evidence of that's ever been uncovered. Mm -hmm. uh, but they decided to use this law that had been drafted initially during the First World War and uh, maintained following the Winnipeg general strike. They were that concerned that there could be a violent revolution. So they feared that uh, there were foreign agents infiltrating society to start a revolution. Did they actually have legitimate reasons to worry about this? This is one of the uh, sticky points because you can look at this, uh, this, this persecution, and it was persecution, mm -hmm. and you can say it was a gross overreaction, but you could also say it was an underreaction in some sense, and that would be a controversial point for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. However, the intelligence that the police had and the military had did indicate there were Russian agents did indicate a huge degree of organization, did indicate a propensity for violence. Um, but they also didn't prosecute everyone they knew about. So Edward Cecil Smith, for instance, he had a massive RCMP file, mm -hmm. very easily could have been put in jail for it because of the nature of this law, which obviously wouldn't hold up to modern standards. Mm -hmm. But the RCMP never pursued that. They Why just not? monitored him. Why did they pursue him? I, I think there is uh, more selectivity in who they put in jail, who they prosecuted, than so class originally played before. a role. Class played a role. Background: He was a quintessential white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. He was not in the inner circle of the party. Uh, he was a leader, but he was not in the inner circle. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't viewed to be that kind of threat. And with the exception of fighting in Spain, which obviously is fighting his violence, mm -hmm. um, he restricted his actions to words, to writing. We actually, uh, he, you described him as a violent pacifist. Yes. Um, when the Spanish Civil War began in 1936, it was a domestic ground war between the, the communist republicans and the fascist nationalists. But it was also a war between two ideologies wanting to dominate internationally, and that's communism and fascism. How did communists and fascists around the world see the stakes of this war? The stakes couldn't be higher. Um, these kinds of conflicts were playing out all around the world, um, and unfortunately, fascism was winning in the majority of uh, these conflicts, and most notably in Portugal, Germany, and Italy. So the, the Communist Party was actually a very, very small part of the Republican government, but it grew in influence because of the support that the Soviet Union gave the Republican government. Over time, Germany and Italy and Portugal provided more and more support for the nationalists. The, Russia provided a fair amount of support, uh, not nearly as much as uh, the fascist states did. Mm -hmm. So you could look at this exact same conflict and see it legitimately as a struggle of democracy against fascism, but also communism against fascism. So it had wide appeal for anyone who fell under that anti-fascist umbrella. And, you know, so let's go back to Edward. Um, at the time, Edward is in his mid-30s. He's married, has a stable job. He's a pacifist. Uh, he's thousands of miles away from Spain with no connection to that country. He doesn't know Spanish, and yet he decides to join nearly 2,000 Canadians and secretly travel to Spain to fight for two years for the Republicans. How come? He became obsessed with what was happening in Spain. He really wanted to go. Uh, because of his status within the party, he needed special permission. And because he was married, he needed even more permission because the Communist Party didn't want to have married men killed in war such that they would have to provide support to the widows. Mm -hmm. So he needed to jump through extra hoops to get over there, and yet he was one of the first Canadians to go over. I think for him, uh, a lot of it had to do with the tremendous amount of military experience he had relative to the other volunteers. He was a regimental sergeant major in the peacetime Canadian militia. He had served in the Shanghai Volunteer Corps in China. Um, this wasn't the kind of military experience that would uh, lend itself to becoming a battalion commander, but he had no idea he was going to end up as a battalion commander. He thought he was going to go as a soldier and, and uh, take up arms. But because of that experience, which was so much relative to uh, the other volunteers, the Canadian volunteers, he quickly skyrocketed. 
to battalion command. We should mention that he was born in China because his parents were missionaries at yes. the time. Um, I want to go through some pictures with you uh, of Edward. Uh, here he is setting off with fellow communist fighters from New York to Europe. Many volunteers told people they were merely going on an extended vacation in France. Uh, and here he is with his men in Spain. Uh, he became the only Canadian to command a whole battalion in Spain, the Mackenzie Papano Battalion. At one point, he was overseeing more than 500 men. Where were all these guys from? Well, the Canadian American battalions, this is always the trouble, we call the Mackenzie Papano Battalion the Canadian Battalion, mm -hmm. but the Canadians and Americans were all mixed together. Latin Americans, especially Cuban volunteers, were mixed in huge numbers of Finnish Canadians, but also Finns from Finland, because there weren't enough Finns coming from Finland for them to have their own unit. So they gravitated towards the Finnish Canadians mm -hmm. within the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. Huge numbers of Ukrainian Canadians all participated in this organization. So it was very, very multicultural, very multilingual. They grouped them by language. That's mostly why we ended up with this English-speaking brigade with a British, Canadian, an American, and Spanish battalion within it. Mm -hmm. And within the organization, there were enough Finnish Canadians and Finns that the whole machine gun company that Edward Cecil Smith had in his organization was mostly Finnish. It sounds kind of like the utopia that we are kind of trying to seek now in our today, today's society. Um, I want to show you another picture. Uh, this is Edward resting on the ground, nursing a wound after an attack. He was shot twice, yes. stabbed once. How bloody did the fighting get? It was uh, extremely bloody fighting, in large part because it was so one-sided in that the nationalists had the vast preponderance of tanks, anti-tank artillery, uh, aircraft, etc., that the Republicans just didn't have. So uh, the, the Canadian volunteers, they didn't have air superiority, for instance. The nationalists just flew over and bombed them when, when they wanted to. to. There was a very little uh, defense against nationalist aircraft. And the fighting was very, very close quarters a lot of the time. So Edward Cecil Smith, the first time he was shot, um, he was sh shot in the rifle. Um, and then was pinned down just dozens of meters away from the nationalist position where he stayed the rest of the day and the night. Very close quarter fighting. Uh, the fact that he was stabbed by a cavalryman's lance at one point, you can't get much closer than that. Frightening stuff. Um, is it true this war was the first time air power was used against civilian targets? There's been other conflicts where it uh, played um, less of a role. There were Zeppelin attacks in the First World War, for instance, but not to the same extent. Um, Pablo Picasso's painting Guernica um, provides, you know, that quintessential image of the, the destruction racked upon civilian targets that became very common in this war, tragically. Um, did many Canadians volunteer to fight on the other side for the fascists? Almost none. There's not much research on that point, but single digits uh, about which we know very little. There was other kinds of support for the nationalist cause, um, but not the kind of volunteering that we saw in the case of the, the Republican cause. Uh, can we draw comparisons between the foreign fighters we saw flood into Spain to take up arms and the Westerners we've seen travel to fight in Ukraine today? I think there's, there's similarities in that volunteers for both um, had a kind of solidarity with the people with the democracies that were facing aggression in the case of Spain from an internal coup d'etat supported by external fascist enemies, and the case now, the, the Russian state as an aggressor against the sovereign Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian people. And the further resonance that one feels when you see these, these crimes being committed against civilians, civilian targets that, that has that just breaks one's heart. Mm -hmm. So for the Canadians who have gone to Ukraine and the Canadians who went to Spain, I think those were, those were common feelings. D does it surprise you that something that used to motivate people so long ago uh, is motivating people now? I think it's very human. It's a, it's a problematic motivation because it complicates statecraft. Uh, the Canadians that went to fight in Spain went against Canadian law. The Canadians who are going to fight Ukraine are not going against Canadian law. And it's also a lot easier to get through Poland into Ukraine than it was to get to, to Spain at the time. 
but it's a very human uh, impulse, I think, that's only been amplified by the kinds of images we're all getting in our phones every day these days. So when Edward and the other volunteers left to the war, they did it in secret. They said they were going on vacation to France. Uh, but after losing the war, uh, the communist foreign fighters, including Edward, returned to Canada. What kind of welcome did they receive at Toronto's Union Station? I think they were very surprised at the kind of welcome they received. The newspapers estimated about 10,000 people came out to greet them at Union Station. And his notes about the experience say that they had a, a lukewarm reception in Halifax, largely because people didn't really know they were coming. But then as they made their way across the country by rail, uh, people started gathering and giving them gifts and celebrating them. And by the time they got to Toronto, which was the main destination where most of them broke off, there were brass bands and celebrations and uh, it, it was a gigantic celebration. What and changed? The uh, people came to know their story. People came to know what they were doing in Spain. Uh, and it had become very clear at that point that the odds of prosecutions against them for having gone to Spain was negligible. Mm -hmm. um, besides, if they left with much noise, there would be a risk that they would be detained, that it would, uh, that it would prevent them from going. They just wanted to get out of the country and get to Spain as quickly as possible. And now they were home. In the book, you document that Edward had a feeling that something worse was to come. And just a few months later, everyone's worst fears came true. World War II begins. To what extent did countries use the Spanish Civil War as a practice run for World War II? Certainly Germany and Italy did. It was a battle lab for them to test airland integration, use of half tracks. Uh, if it wasn't for Franco's direct intervention, and um, how tanks were distributed across the force in the 1938 Aragon Offensive, we would have seen something. It was similar to Blitzkrieg and to Poland, but um, even more so um, in this case. So they very much used it as, as a laboratory to test their equipment. And in fact, there was some early efforts to gather information from the MACPAPs by the Canadian Army, because these were the first soldiers who had fired a Bren gun in battle, who had received fire from a Panzer I tank or an 88 millimeter um, artillery piece. And I mentioned that Edward had a feeling that something worse was coming. Um, he kind of predicted World War II. Why did he get the sense that something worse was coming? Well, he'd seen the strength of the, the fascist militaries um, in Spain. He felt that Germany and Italy had certainly been emboldened by the negligible resistance they'd received in Spain. Uh, and he saw the, the growing conflict of ideologies around the world. He'd been predicting, he'd been talking about something like the Second World War even before the Spanish Civil War happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and he saw this all as part of this global conflict of ideologies. And he came pretty close to predicting the, uh, the actual date. He thought he would, that Germany would invade Poland a little bit earlier in the summer, but Otherwise, he was pretty close. Um, did Edward remain a staunch communist to the end? He didn't. Uh, it's not, there wasn't a clean break between him and the Communist Party. During the Second World War, he did some organizing. He joined the Canadian Army against Communist Party wishes. And then his communist background got him kicked out of the Canadian Army. Uh, and he went back to labor organizing. There was no clear break. He never publicly denounced the Communist Party. but. By the end of the Second World War, there was no real connection. He'd managed to get a ordinary job in mainstream journalism, and he stuck with that. He had a, a long and fulfilling career as a magazine editor. And he would take his family out to meals. It just kind of felt to me that um, he didn't seem to really fit in anywhere uh, when he joined the party because he was a religious person that didn't kind of gel with the party. And then uh, they didn't consider him to be a party person. Um, was there something that de-radicalized him? I think the main thing that de-radicalized him was the prosperity of the, of the late 40s, early 50s. He went from living, you know, he had a job, but for the most part, he lived um, hand to mouth during the Depression, as, as many he did. Mm -hmm. His wife had tuberculosis, which was contracted due to poor housing. At different points, they changed homes three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. They had a home, but they, they had to move routinely. So life was hard. And then come late 40s, early 1950s, he had a job, he had a house, 
He ended up with two houses, one that he could provide for uh, his parents-in-law, and a car. Life was good. It's a lot harder to be a radical um, when the system is working for you. Hmm. I mean, that's a conversation for another day, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so after winning the war, uh, Francisco Franco would rule Spain until 1975. What do you think Edward would have thought about the fact that this fascist dictator ended up ruling Spain for nearly 40 years? Well, when he was alive, he was heartbroken by it, and Cecil Smith lived to be lived until 1963. So, he he never knew uh, a free Spain. He, Franco outlived him. He never saw even a glimmer of hope for the Spanish Republic having some kind of democratic resurgence. Um, that broke his heart and broke many people's heart. This was the lost cause for them. And how did Edward deal with the fact that the communist Soviet Union? he idolized, was committing so many atrocities against its own people. He thought some of that was propaganda. However, um, especially during the period of the Sino-Soviet split, because he was so, so closely interconnected with, uh, with, with China, um, he really began to question both systems. Now, he had broken from the party years earlier, so that wasn't as uh, jarring for him as it might have been otherwise, because he'd already decided this isn't the system that works best, and then he saw increasing evidence that where that system had played out, it truly was not working. Mm. Uh, your book describes how Edward's wife, Lillian, may, may have been a lover of famous Canadian so so socialist surgeon, uh, Norman Bethune. Who was Norman Bethune? Norman Bethune is arguably the most famous Canadian anywhere ever because he is so widely known within China. He's not particularly well known in Canada, but he went to Spain. He ran a blood transfusion service, and after he came back from Spain, he went to China and worked with Mao's Eighth Root Army. Uh, he is one of the only foreigners that Mo, Mao spoke very highly of and recorded him in his, uh, in his collected writings, um, largely because Bethune, you know, gave everything up, went to China, helped the Chinese people through the Eighth Root Army, and, and he died there. He uh, cut himself during surgery, contracted sepsis, and died. I think it's so fascinating, the little tidbits of information you have in this book. How did you research this book? There's... The RCMP records are incredible. They kept very detailed records on active communists, so once you get through the access to information process, a whole world opens up. Uh, missionaries keep extraordinary records. But one of the key unifying things was uh, Edward Cecil Smith's son, Bill Smith, was in possession of the, a photo of Mao Zedong and Norman Bethune sitting together, and it's the only photo we have of that. And I, when I, what did you think when you saw it? it I, you immediately start thinking, this can't be what I th think it is. This story can't be, uh, they, I'm like, how is this possible? How is this story not known? And then you start scratching the paint and you find out that, well, Lillian is mentioned in Norman Bethune's will, but no one knew who she was. And she's mentioned in a letter Bethune wrote to Tim Buck. And you could just keep following these things until a coherent story emerges. And you did this, you researched this book on the side of your life. What was, what interested you about Edward's life? He was a man who had connections to China, Spain, and Canada. That in itself was extraordinary to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that he was, um, he wasn't a central leader, but he was a leader. He was always trying to just do what he thought was best in spite of the risks. And um, we now know the horrors of, of communism and know what, what played out in these countries. He didn't. With the information that he had, he really thought he saw a way forward, a better way for, for Canadians. And he, and he pushed for that in a nonviolent way. Uh, except, of course, in Spain, where he was fighting, but in uniform of the elected Spanish Republican Army. Mm. Well, speaking of what we know now, uh, when we look back, uh, what lessons should people take from the Spanish Civil War? I think we're seeing it play out right now. Uh, the degree to which people um, feel constrained by the international system. We're watching Russia's invasion of Ukraine and people want to help 
People understand why certain actions cannot be taken, but people want to help on so many levels. So even when we look at the, the horrors, the atrocities that are playing out, there is, uh, there is something to be said for um, people's deep desire to help out where they can. And we're, we're seeing that with Canadians right now. Mm -hmm. so that's the silver lining to these really horrific stories, I suppose. And you love history. And at the beginning of your book, I think you um, mentioned a history teacher. When we look back on history, how can it help us inform where we are going? I think that most people's view of history could more accurately be described as an understanding of myth and legend. And myth and legend uh, are important. They, they hold people together, they're stories, um, but they're often not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and the truth about who we are and where we come from, that requires kind of a disciplined looking at history. Uh, because in writing the myth and legend, we erase people. Mm. We erase indigenous people. We erase persons of color. We erase people who were not in positions of power. We erase people like Edward Cecil Smith, mm. who in the mainstream was just a, a magazine editor. But in that less illuminated space, there are fascinating people who might be more like your average Canadian than we think. Mm. Everybody has a story, right? Everyone has a story. Yeah, congratulations. It's, I, it has, it's one of my favorite books Thank because you. the threads that it has and the power of one individual, um, it's really a great read. Congratulations, Tyler. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with us. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nan Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.